Good morning, and welcome this morning. A couple of uh, notes I want to read here before we begin with the announcements. Um, one about Pam Armstrong. Um, Pam Armstrong was moved to Heritage Health on Friday in Hoopston for rehab and therapy. And after that, um, when she progresses even more, then she'll be allowed to go back home. So please continue to pray for her improvement. Also, I have a note uh, I picked up this morning from Aldine. It says, I would, like to th I would like to express my heartfelt thanks to you, my church family, for all the cards, visits, phone calls, food, and especially the help you gave, um, excuse me, especially the help you gave me each day. Most of all, the prayers. Thank you. My family wishes to thank you for all the help, too. What a blessing you were to me. God bless you. And praise God that we can be there for her. The congregational meeting will be held Monday, February 1st. I don't think you realize how hard it is for me not to say congressional meeting. That's so, yes, our, our annual meeting will be held Monday um, at 7 p.m. on the 1st. The ladies' Bible study will resume Wednesday, February 3rd at 9 a.m., and that is here at the church in the basement. Evening service will begin again Sunday, February 7th, 6 p.m. here at the church. And just a reminder, Silas left several books for us to use and for our benefit. Um, they are located downstairs in the classroom right by the entrance to the lift. Um, please take advantage of that. If there's anything that you might um, want to look into or curious about, I'm sure there is a book that is on that subject or at least adjacent to that subject. He has quite a collection. Are there any other praises or... Okay, uh, mission board people, you're on call right after church in the basement. There's a short meeting. Charlie. Charlie's here today, and what a blessing to see him back. And he wanted to thank everyone for everything you did for him, the cards and the visits. And that is a blessing. That is one of the benefits of having a church that's a family. All right, if there's nothing else. Good morning. Let's begin this morning with hymn number 224, My Savior's Love, and let's do verses 1, 2, 4, and 5. I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene. Savior's love for me, for me 
to hymn number 453, Nothing But the Blood. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood Turn to him number 516. Cleanse me.
you please be seated. Good morning. Great to hear you guys singing this morning. I'd like to thank everybody who's downstairs with the uh, kids today and the work that they do. And um, just such a, a great way to, to serve and an area where we can always use help. Carrie is back in the, it's not really a booth, I guess, but back in the uh, sound area with Eric today. And much cuter than looking at Doug. If you want to turn to Luke chapter 22 this morning, we'll be do, doing communion here in a few moments. And so the sermon this morning is actually on the subject of communion. Luke chapter 22, verses 14 to 21. And when the hour came, he reclined at the table and the apostles with him. And he said to them, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he said, Take this and divide it among yourselves. For I tell you that from now on I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And likewise, the cup after they had eaten, saying, This cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. But behold, the hand of him who betrays me is with me on the table. For the Son of Man goes as it has been deter determined, but woe to the man by whom he is betrayed. Would you pray with me? Our Heavenly Father, we come before you to again worship your great name. We praise you for your majesty over your creation and your sovereignty over our world. Lord, we thank you for your Son who has come into our world to bring salvation. Lord, we continue to pray for recovery for Aldeen. Lord, and so thankful that she's back at home, getting stronger every day. Continue to pray for Wendell. Lord, as he gets better, 
Lord, we want to pray for, again, for his recovery and healing and just every day to, to be getting stronger and feeling better. Lord, also pray for Doug and so thankful that he's back at home this morning and just uh, continue to pray for the medication that he's been on and for a, a sweeter recovery and for Doug to get back to 100%. Lord, I thank you for the opportunity to pray for these saints. Lord, we pray that you would bless our time in your word this morning. And we pray that you would use this study in your word to prepare our hearts and minds for the communion in which we will soon partake. In Jesus' name, amen. So as I mentioned, we'll be taking communion here in just a little bit. I love this quote from Lee Eklov, who's a retired pastor. I had him as a professor for a class when I was at Trinity. The table of the Lord isn't where sinners find Christ, but where sinners celebrate being found. In our section this morning, Jesus institutes the Lord's Supper, also known as communion, also known as the Eucharist, with his disciples. All those terms refer to the same thing. The Lord's Supper is one of two ordinances that this church observes, the other being baptism. We call them ordinances because they are ordained in Scripture. And as we begin with our exploration of this topic, I begin with a question. Why? Why do we do communion? Now, obviously, the first answer is it's because Jesus told us to do that. And that's true. And that's the most important reason. But why did he command it? Have you ever thought about that? About six times a year, we take a small piece of bread, almost like a cracker. It's actually unleavened bread that we use, and a little bit of juice. Why did Jesus tell us to do that? The reason for the Lord's Supper and why we're commanded to do the Lord's Supper did not come from nowhere. And so before we celebrate the Lord's Supper, we're going to talk about its significance, past, present, and future. And the first section is background to our main text this morning. And the Old Testament, in the book of Exodus, the Israelites had been enslaved by the Egyptians. Pharaoh would not release the Israelites, and God struck Egypt with a series of plagues. Water turned to blood, locusts, hail, darkness. But after all these plagues, the Egyptians still had not relented in letting the Israelites go. And so God brings one final plague. He strikes dead the firstborn of all of the Egyptians. That's the background for the Old Testament holiday called Passover. And we see the instructions for Passover in Exodus 12. At the first Passover, each Israelite, that is to say each Jewish household, was to select a lamb. And if a family was too small or couldn't afford a lamb, they would partner up and go in together with another household and buy a lamb together. But it was household to household, and there was a sacrifice of a lamb that was necessary at the Passover. They'd sacrifice the lamb, and they would take some of the lamb's blood, and they would sprinkle it on their door outside their home. This was an act of faith, trusting the deliverance that would come from the Lord that he had promised. And Passover could not be a more appropriate name for that holiday because on the first Passover, the faithful of the Lord were literally passed over and their lives were spared. In the Old Testament, the key event was God redeem redeeming the Israelites from Egypt. Throughout the rest of the Old Testament, it is constantly referenced it is constantly pointed to to show God's goodness, his faithfulness, and grace to his people. And so the Passover and the celebration of Passover was meant to be an annual remembrance, a feast to commemorate that original Passover event held in the springtime. 
Exodus chapter 12, verse 8, gives some of the instructions for this meal. The people would eat the lamb that had been sacrificed. Exodus 12, verse 8 says, They shall eat the flesh that night, roasted on the fire, with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. They shall eat it. Notice that it also gives instructions that they would eat unleavened bread. Now, many of the instructions for Passover aim at speed. Unleavened bread is bread without a leavening agent, such as yeast, which causes the bread to rise, which takes time. And so, to make the bread in the fastest way possible, they used unleavened bread, which, again, is a reminder of the haste with which the Israelites had to flee from Egypt. Speed. And these elements of the first Passover remained as part of the annual Passover celebration. Over time, the Passover meal was expanded. You would still eat the lamb, the bitter herbs, unleavened bread. There was wine that became part of the feast. Actually, four cups of wine that became part of the feast. And all of that background brings us to our second section, the Lord's Supper present. And the present way we celebrate it is based on the way in which Jesus instituted it. So chapter, Luke chapter 22, verses 14 to 16. And when the hour came, he reclined at the table and the apostles with him. And he said to them, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. As Jesus sat with his disciples, it was the time for the Passover meal, also called a Seder. And that's where they sat with Jesus. Verse 17. And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he said, Take this and divide it among yourselves. I mentioned that there was more than one cup that became part of this Passover dinner. Culturally, the second cup was the point of the meal where the Passover story would be retold. The disciples were all Jewish. They had all grown up celebrating Passover every year. Every year hearing the story of the Exodus, of God redeeming his people from slavery. But at this Passover, they sit with the Lord. And the significance of this Passover isn't about being redeemed from physical slavery, but redeemed from spiritual slavery, redeemed from the penalty of sin. It's interesting that it was not part of the tradition for everyone to share the same cup at the Seder, but that's what Jesus does. And in doing that, he stresses solidarity and unity. And so the disciples pass the cup around. Jesus, at this point, has still yet to institute the Lord's Supper. This cup is before that. And this part of the story is only recorded in Luke's Gospel. In verse 19, here we come to Jesus giving the words of institution. And he took bread... And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Again, it's the Passover Seder. All about remembering what God has done for his people. And Jesus takes that familiar unleavened bread, and he breaks it. Unleavened bread is brittle. It's not like a loaf of bread where you can pull it apart or tear it apart. It cracks when you break it. This is my body, which is given for you. Bread is something that we talked about earlier this past year in the Gospel of John. Something so simple, so universal, such a staple of life. Something that we need for physical nourishment. In his, in his ministry, Jesus taught, I am the bread of life. Verse 20. And likewise, the cup after they'd eaten, saying, This cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. 
Again, the wine had been part of this Passover meal for generations. But Jesus here is showing its true meaning. The cup is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. There had been an old covenant, but Jesus says that the cup that is poured out now is the new covenant. After the first Passover, after the Lord had delivered the Israelites from Egypt, God made a covenant with the Israelites. That is the Mosaic covenant, or also sometimes referred to as the Old Covenant. The covenant is found in Exodus chapters 19 through 24. Part of that includes the Ten Commandments, the basis for the law of the Old Covenant, God's moral expectations for his people. Exodus chapter 24, the covenant was ratified, the Old Covenant. Now, part of that covenant also included sacrifice. And in Exodus chapter 24, we see the sacrifice, but I want to focus on what's done with the blood in that chapter. Exodus chapter 24, verse 6, And Moses took half of the blood and put it in basins, and half of the blood he threw against the altar. But then in verse 8, we see what Moses did with the remainder of the blood. Exodus 24, verse 8. And Moses took the blood and threw it on the people and said, Behold, the blood of the covenant that the Lord has made with you in accordance with all these words. Now, consider this for just a moment. Moses took the blood and threw it on the people. You don't really throw blood. It's a liquid. More appropriately, Moses sprinkled the blood on these people. But think about it for a moment. The Old Covenant blood is literally on the people. The Israelites are in the desert. Water's not plentiful. It's not like they can take their clothes to the laundromat. They don't have washing machines. They didn't have multiple outfits. They're pretty much wearing what they have. Washing clothes is difficult. So blood sprinkled on those clothes would set in. Even if it was just a few drops of blood. Think about that for a moment. The clothes that they wore when Moses did them would have had little spatters of blood from the animal that was sacrificed for them. A constant reminder of the covenant that they made with the Lord after God had redeemed them. And always on their clothes, during all of their wanderings in the desert, a constant sign of God's covenant with his people. Just a little bit later on, at the end of Exodus chapter 24, verse 11, this is this, the end of that part of that verse. It says what Moses and the Israelite elders did next. They beheld God and ate and drank. They had a meal. I feel like we've seen meals other places in the Bible. So I return us to the Lord's Supper. Luke 22, verse 20. And likewise, the cup after they had eaten, saying, this cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood, the blood of Christ poured out for the new covenant. Now, that's a reference to Jeremiah chapter 31. Verse 31, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Way back in the Old Testament, pointing forward to the new covenant. Jeremiah 31, 32. Not like the covenant that I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant that they broke, they broke that by sinning and going against God's covenant and law. Though I was their husband, declares the Lord. A constant symbol that we see throughout the Bible, this almost marital relationship as a symbol of God's relationship to his people. God's people unfaithful. As the bride, Israel is the unfaithful bride in the Old Testament. But God is still faithful to his people regardless. Verse 33. 
For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them, and I will write it on their hearts. That is the sign of the new covenant, God pouring out his Holy Spirit on the believers. The Israelites had broken the law, but here we see that God will write the law on the hearts of his people, the new covenant. The rest of verse 33 into verse 34. And I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And no longer shall each one teach his neighbor and each his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more. That is the covenant that the Lord is bringing to his people. And that Jesus, at the Lord's Supper, and at the Last Supper, says, This is the blood of the new covenant. The Mosaic Covenant revolved around land and keeping the law in order to maintain the land. And as we've said, the people failed at this. But Jesus brings a greater covenant. And at the Last Supper, when he sat with his apostles, he was telling them, now is the time of the new covenant. Prophesied in Jeremiah 31 that that was what he was ushering in at that meal. That's the Lord's Supper, a sign of the covenant that the Lord Jesus came into the world to bring. The Lord's Supper is important. Sadly, I think too many churches, especially Protestant churches, approach this almost like a chore, something that you have to do. But it's a sacred command from the Lord Jesus himself that we get to participate in something that he himself instituted almost 2,000 years ago, something that unites us within the church and church history. And most importantly, it is a call to remember the gospel. The bread and the drink are things that we physically ingest. You really eat the bread. You really drink from the cup. Symbols that point us to the real body and blood of Christ which was broken for our sins and shed for our sins. That Jesus is the real bread and the wine. Physical symbols used to remind us of reality. Symbols are important. I wear a wedding ring. It's just a ring. But what it symbolizes is what matters. My commitment to carry. The American flag is just a piece of cloth by itself, but it's what it represents that matters. We have all sorts of symbols. Symbolism pervades literature and art. We do things for symbolic reasons. We commemorate certain days. We establish family traditions. And when we take the Lord's Supper, using these powerful symbols is a reminder of the gospel. Christ's body broken for us, for your sins and mine, and his blood shed for us. Like the ancient Israelites who Moses sprinkled blood upon, those drops of blood on their clothes, a reminder of the covenant that God made with his people, the Lord's Supper, a continual reminder and remembrance of what Jesus has done for us. We can never spend too much time reflecting on the gospel, what Jesus has done for us, that there is a cost for our sins, and that Jesus paid that price for all who trust in him. At this church, we practice open communion, where anyone who believes in Jesus as Lord and Savior is welcome to partake. And we come to a third point. The Lord's Supper future. In our passage, several times Jesus points forward. Luke 22, verses 15 and 16. I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer, for I tell you, I will not eat it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. 
Jesus says, I will not eat until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Referring to the end times. He references that again in this passage. Verse 18. For I tell you that from now on I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. The Lord's Supper. Past, present, and future. In the past, it was something that pointed to God's miracle of redeeming Israel. In the present, it points us to the gospel and what Christ has done for us. But it points forward still to the future hope. Because Jesus has died to redeem us and has promised eternity. The book of Revelation depicts a great wedding feast at the end of times. Now, in the opening chapters of the book of Revelation, Jesus has been active with his churches. In Revelation 4, the apostle John is given a vision of the throne room of heaven. This wondrous sight to behold. But Jesus is absent until we get to chapter 5. And John sees a lamb standing as though he had been slain. And the lamb has been slain, but he is risen. And because the lamb of God that was slain for the sins of man has died and risen, it is therefore our hope for all who believe in him that we too can stand before God in the throne room of heaven. In Revelation 19, there we see the vision of the great wedding feast. And who is the groom? The lamb. At the first Passover, a lamb was slain. When Jesus instituted the Lord's Supper, it was on the night before his own crucifixion, where he would serve as the lamb to be slain. But that points forward still to the wedding feast that the lamb hosts. Jesus is the lamb. He is the Lord of the great wedding feast. Jesus sacrificed himself so that we could be with him. Revelation chapter 19 verse 9 says, Blessed are those who were invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And all of us are invited. But do we believe in him? Do we trust in him? Is he our hope for admittance to that feast? The Lord's Supper, past, present, and future. It's interesting to think about the Passover feast. That was something done with your family. Jesus institutes the Lord's Supper. And that's something to be done with your church family. But that still points forward still to the ultimate feast. When we will partake with the entire family of believers of Christ's church. To the glory of God. Would you pray with me? Our Heavenly Father, we do thank you for your Son, who is the Lamb, who has died and risen and lives forever, Lord, and through whom we have eternal life. To the praise of your glorious name, in Jesus' name, amen. If the deacons would come forward, And just like the last few times where we've done communion, we have the bread and the cup um, together. So when you pull it up, you'll pull two cups up, and at the bottom is where the bread is. And just a reminder, we'll do the bread together as I read the passage, and then we'll do the cup together. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took the bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me.
For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Would you pray with me? Our Heavenly Father, we do proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. And Lord, we thank you that we have a perfect Savior, a perfect spotless Lamb, who went to the cross for our sins, Lord, so that we could be forgiven. Lord, but let us not lose sight of our sins, that without Christ, separate us and alienate us from you. And let us praise you for the glorious grace that he extends to all who believe and trust in him as Lord and Savior. In Jesus' name, amen. I mean, singing... Number 223. Oh, how he loves you and me. Now may the God of peace who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with everything good that you may do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Have a great week.